Hello, this is Professor Dan Kernler of Elgin Community College. This is yet another video in my statistics series. Here we are continuing probability and we're going to introduce the idea of a random variable. Let's get to it. Alright, so like most topics, we're going to introduce this concept by way of an example. Suppose we have an experiment here and we're flipping a fair coin three times and we are counting the number of heads. So we might have the first flip could be either a head or a tails and then if we draw like a little tree diagram then for each of those there can be a head of tails and then for each of those there can be a head of tails. So let's add a column here that is the total number of heads. Uh, the first one there we could have heads 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 so that would be three. The second one we could have heads heads tails so that would be two uh, etc all the way down. And then let's combine these and make a little table. We're going to make a table where we have one column. We'll call it for x, which is the number of heads. So we'll make a variable there. That will be 0, 1, 2, or 3. And then the probability, let's see, there's one way to get no heads. That would be tails, tails, tails. Three ways to get one, three ways to get two, and then one way to get three. This thing here, this x, this number of heads, this is a random variable. There's a probability experiment here, flipping three coins, and then we're quantifying that by counting the number of heads. That's what a random variable is, is we're quantifying some, the outcome of some probability experiment. The probabilities that we have here in the table, those are called the probability distribution how the probability is distributed. There are different ways to get a probability distribution. We can get a table, um, we can give a graph, and then most common is we'll have some kind of formula to compute those probabilities. All right, that's the definition of a random variable. The next thing we wanna talk about, it's really important, is how to compute the mean of a random variable. Sounds kind of boring, but it has some really interesting applications. All right, let's do the same thing. Let's do an example to introduce this. So now, instead of flipping the coins, let's say we roll two dice and we define our random variable x to be the sum of the two dice. Well, as you can see, there are 36 total possible outcomes. So if we want to compute the mean, that's going to be adding up all of these totals and divide by 36. Because there's so much repetition, though, let's simplify our life a little bit. So, yes, there's only one way to get a 2, but for 3s, there are 2 of them. So let's, let's take that 3, that sum of 3, and double it. Uh, for 4s, there are 3 of them. For 5s, there are 4 of them, etc., all the way down until we get that 12 on the bottom right. Okay. We're going to play around with this a little bit. And remember with adding fractions, you can add them all if they have the same denominator. Let's do the opposite here and let's break this apart and put them all over 36. So we can take 2 times 1 over 36. That's 1 out of the 36. You can see the 2 times 1. Then 3 times 2 over 36, etc. But what are those 36s? Well, those are the probabilities that 1 over 36 is the probability of getting a sum of 2. There's only 1 out of the 36 total possible, out total possible outcomes. The 2 out of 36 for the 3, well, that's the two ways to get a sum of 3, etc. So if we multiply all those together, add them all up, we get 7. That means the mean of this random variable is 7. Now, that doesn't mean that it's always going to be 7. In fact, there's only 6 of them. So there are 6 7s. What it means is, in the long run, our average, if we roll two dice, write down the sum, roll two dice, write down the sum, roll two dice, write down the sum, in the long run, our average will be seven. If we generalize this, we get the mean of the random variable is this kind of funky little formula here. There's a little Greek letter sigma, x multiplied by probability. So what this means is the x's are our outcomes of our random variable. They're the different possible ones. So for ours, it was the two through 12. The P of X, the probability of X, those are the probabilities that you could compute or you calculate or you figure out somehow. So then you multiply those together. That's the X's times their corresponding probabilities. And then that Greek letter sigma means you add them all up. So you add all of those up. That's how you get that seven. You take the, prob the, the value times its corresponding probability, add them all up. You get the mean of that random variable. 
Now, other notation here, this is often sometimes referred to as the expected value. E of x, the expected value. Doesn't mean that when I roll two dice again that I can expect a seven, but it's like the long-term average expected value. It's a long-term average. Let's look at another example. Let's look at, look at the roulette wheel. This is an American roulette wheel. It has the numbers uh, 0, double zero, and then 1 through 36. And then you spin the wheel and a ball ends up and it ends up on one of those numbers. There's a variety of different bets you can make. One of them is called a dozen bet, where you pick either 1 through 12, uh, 13 through 24, or 25 through 36. Uh, you bet a dollar. If you win, you get your dollar back and two. So you net Two dollars. If you lose, you lose your dollar. So let's make a probability experiment or a probability question out of this. What is the expected value of a dozen bet? Well, we need to quantify this probability experiment of the ball rolling around. So let's say x, let's let x be the net value, like our profit, our actual net value that we would take away. There's two possibilities then. A loss there would be a net value of negative one, and then a win would be a net value of positive two. Let's make a table. We'll get our probability distribution so we can have either negative one or two. Um, let's look at that roulette wheel. Don't so remember, the wheel has zero, double zero, then one through 36. So if we're making a dozen bet, let's just, for sake of example, let's say we're looking at the numbers one through 12. Well, that means there are 12 out of a total of 38 ways to win. So on our table then, 12 out of 38 goes for the probability of having a net value of two. And then negative one is gonna be everything else. So that's gonna be 26 out of 38. The key here that makes this unfair is that extra zero and double zero. And we'll see how this works out in the expected value. But the expected value is you sum the possible random variable values times the probability. Okay, well we have negative one times 26 out of 38 and positive two times 12 out of 38. Multiply those together, negative two out of 38, we get negative 0 0.05. What this means is on average, this type of bet is gonna lose five cents on average. Now, sometimes you'll win, sometimes you'll lose. On average, in the long run, you're gonna lose five cents. So if you pay, play 100 times, you might win some, you might lose some, you're probably gonna be out $5, okay? It's a long-term average. That's what this expected value means. Uh, incidentally, this expected value for roulette, I believe it's the same expected value for every possible bet. They're certainly all negative, and I believe they're all negative five cents, so don't play roulette. All right, here's a different example in the book Enumeracy by John Allen Paulos. Suppose we have a medical clinic and they test people for a disease that one out of 100 people suffer from. We have 50 people coming in and we're wondering if instead of testing all 50 individually, we could pool them all together. And then if the test ends up negative, then all 50 are healthy. And then if not, what we'll do is we'll test each one individually. And the question then is, well, how many tests would we have to perform here on average? How many tests could we expect to perform if we do it this way? Instead of giving each person the test, we pool all those blood samples together. Here's how this would work. We have our 50 people. What we're going to do is we're going to draw a blood sample from each of them, pool it all together, and then test that pooled blood sample. If it's negative, boom, all 50 are healthy. If it's positive and it comes back with the disease, we have to go back to the 50 and test them all individually to see, ah, here are the, in this case, two, whatever, here's the one or two or three or five or whatever that have this particular disease. The question then is, how many tests on average would we expect to run in the long run if we do this? Let's make a random variable. Let's let X be the number of tests required. There's two possibilities. We could either have one test, meaning it's negative, so you pull them all together, you run one test, negative, done. Or you have to run 51. You have to do the pooled test, but then you also have to test them all individually. Well, the probability of this, let's see, let's take a look at the one. That would be that they're all healthy. So the probability that X is one is the probability that none have the disease. If you recall, it was one out of 100 have this disease. 
So the probability that none have it would be 99 out of 100 to the 50th power. We're assuming all the individuals are independent. So they're all, we're assuming independence here. Okay, so that's about 0 0.605. Now the, the 51, we could just use the complement rule um, and just subtract that from one. But you could formally say, well, the probability that at least one has the disease, that's the 51. Well, that would be one minus the probability of none. So you subtract those two and you get about 0.395, which we know because those two should add up to one. Okay, so the expected value, you multiply the outcomes, either 1 or 51 at times their corresponding probability, we get about 20.8. Ah, so on average, using this new system, you'd only use about 21 tests, which is a lot less than 50 testing them all individually. So a clinic might choose to do this if they want to save money on the number of tests that they run because this particular method uses a lot less tests. Okay, last part of this video is computing the standard deviation of a random variable. This one is actually less common. We're, we're much more interested in the mean, the expected value. That happens a lot more often. But we should talk about this just for completeness sake so you've seen it. Um, we know that the mean of this two dice, we know that it was seven. So let's compute the variance like we would for a regular value. You take those um, values, the different, uh, what do we have here for dice? Two, three, four, et cetera, up to 12. Subtract the mean, square it, divide by n, and add them all up. The difference here is we're going to weight them because there's more of each one. So we're going to have 2 minus 7 squared, but then we're going to multiply that by, well, in this case, there's only one of those. Same thing, 3 minus 7 squared times there's two of those. There's three of the fours, et cetera, down to the 12s. That's the same thing that we did for the mean, though. It's really taking that, in this case, it's not x times the probability. It's x minus the mean squared times the probability. So if we generalize that, we get the sum x minus the mean, the quantity squared, times the probability. Now, I didn't compute it here. I don't really care what the standard deviation is for this example. I just want to get this formula. This is the formula for the variance of a random variable. So sigma squared, this is variance, not standard deviation. So it's the sum. You take x minus the mean. You square it, multiply times the probability, and then add all of those up. All right, that's it for this video. Hope you enjoyed it. If you're interested in seeing more of these, you can subscribe, hit the bell to get notified. There's a whole series of these coming out. Uh, also, huge thank you to the Elgin Community College Board of Trustees, which approved my sabbatical for the spring 2021 semester. And that's what gave me the time to record, edit, produce, and upload all of these videos to YouTube so you could watch them. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you in the next one.